So we're going to start uh, the next debate. Political centralism is an accelerator of or obstacle to innovation with Nicolas Bavarez, Gaspard Koenig, Philippe Chang, and moderated by Claude Le Pen. You have the timer here, Claude. Tu as le timer, qu'elle a, hein? Bonjour. Yes, hello. So this is debate 11, political centralism. Is it an accelerator of or obstacle to innovation? So to a good healthcare system, when we looked at this theme, we wondered what the link was between centralization and decentralization and its link to health. In fact, the link has been uh, debated already. It was debated yesterday. We've seen that there is a regional dimension when it comes to financing health care with questions that were not raised, but which will be raised today. What has to be decentralized? Uh, do we have to decentralize the budget? What about the objectives? Uh, what are the regional objectives in terms of health care insurance? Do we have to centralize uh, rates, uh, prices like the English do? including for GPs, the capitation formula that should be used. What about hospital budgets? Uh, uh, should they be regionalized? Do we need to decentralize uh, political authorities uh, for pathologies? What about social problems? We have to take into account this local aspect when we're preparing policies? Should we decentralize decision-making centers? Should we get elected officials involved in decision-making at regional level and have a political decentralization rather than administrative decentralization? So these are the questions that we're going to try and deal with during this debate. But before that, I want to ask a more fundamental question which concerns our French centralism. So everybody knows we have one of the most centralized systems in the world, including when we compare it to national health systems such as uh, England or Sweden, where the idea of a national system is not incompatible with broader coverage of regional realities, especially in England, where there's a real decentralization from a financial point of view. So we've got a national health policy, we've got regional policies, which is more regionalized. And then there's a question of safety and quality. Why do we have this centralism in France in particular? Why do we have this centralism in France, which is not specific to the health sector, which we see it in all sectors? The question is, what is behind this aspiration, this uh, centralized uh, operation of our society? Why do we have this centralism? Is it because of a fear of uh, some kind of national breakup? A, a, a fear of federalism, the old regime? Is that why we want to have a lot of national cohesion? We know that in regimes that are decentralized, that are federal, health is one of the first uh, authorities to be delegated to states in Germany, Spain, and Italy. Is it uh, equality that comes into play? We want everybody to be dealt with equally, regardless of their locality. So national equality uh, takes over from local equality. Is it because of efficiency? If it comes from the top, it's more efficient, we think, than having a local uh, disorder that is often associated with the market, with the market being decentralized, it seems to be more disorganized than a kind of uh, Soviet-like organization that we cited yesterday, where the healthcare system looks like uh, what you find in Hungary or Romania in the 70s, uh, you know, where you have uh, models for calculating optimal prices, but everything comes from the top, from the sky. Is autonomy not seen as some kind of disorder and the state as a guarantor of order? Perhaps uh, this is what we need to start thinking about but before moving on to the technical issues. Are we all Jacobites 
Or can we do something different? Should we reform everything? Should we? Can we? Uh, think about this question. So these are the questions that we're going to start with, with Nicolas, who's a historian. He's an economist. And he's perhaps going to give us his historical vision of this dimension in the history of France, but also in relation to other countries that have social experiences that are similar to ours, but in a different universe. So if we look at the history of healthcare systems, we started with a big decentralization because it's the world of private charity and the church. So it was the period of hospices and uh, there are other monuments uh, that uh, uh, pay tribute to this. So we then we saw companies being involved at the end of the 19th century, the state being involved, notably in Germany. The first uh, social laws were emerged with Bismarck, and then the crises of the 20th century that led to uh, the welfare state. But this welfare state, or these welfare states in the plural have different structures. There are centralized uh, structures, NHS, uh, decentralized. This was the case of Germany and uh, Northern Europe. And then intermediate structures like France. And behind this question of centralization, decentralization, there are other questions, efficiency, financial balance, governance, but also fundamental issues of trust or distrust. So to answer the question that was raised by Claude Le Plain, when we look at things today, what is the balance between centralization and decentralization? What are the arguments on each side of the fence? There are three arguments for centralization. The first is financial balance. We have to manage uh, shortages. We uh, in uh, financial constraints and we introduce rationing. Then we've got access to care and the third reason is safety, especially when it comes to drugs. We have to have upstream controls to make sure that what we are using is reliable. Now decentralization. Today there are four fundamental arguments that correspond to the world of the 20th century. As we've already said, we're seeing this world healthcare market emerging with a, a growth rate of 20% a year. And by definition, it cannot be controlled by states because it's inside the nation states that we have built the welfare states. The second aspect is on this market, like everywhere else, there's a growing demand for individualization. So on the demand side, there's a lot of individualization. On the supply side, for outpatients and health care, we've got more decentralization at regional and individual level. The third reason that's been very well illustrated in the first roundtable of the morning is research. The idea that innovation is coordinated from the top and it comes from public research. That is an idea that no longer works. The research that is carried out in universities, that is in startups, is done from the bottom up. And the, the last reason that we haven't talked about much is prevention. In the world of prevention, it's a world where people have to accept. It's a world where trust is required, where individuals have to accept prevention-based behaviors. So the injunction, the obligation from the top is antonymous with prevention. And I will finish here. Today, we have a real French exception. In other words, with this intermediate system, we've shifted to a forced centralization. If you look at the supply around the hospitals, it's true for financing with the control. It's true for data where there's a real problem. Uh, data is not open. And it's true for regulation where we've got a deficit of strategies and where we've accumulated strata with uh, regional health authorities, so these administrative layers. And there's also a French exception because when we look at Europe, the systems that have become modernized in Germany, uh, they've got regionalization, for example, in Sweden, you know that there are three uh, stages, primary care, hospitals, and then there is regions for specialized care. And the Swedish reform consisted in shifting as much investment as possible to uh, primary care and then switching patients, sending them on from that base.
So that's why today France is an exception in relation to the major trends on the market and in relation to the reforms of healthcare systems in Europe. So if I understand properly, Nicola, the basic problem is a lack of trust. The state doesn't trust civil society or citizens. Is that what we're is that what we're seeing? Well, it's a long story. But if we want to say things very quickly, summarize things, health is, healthcare policies are like many other policies in France. It's a nation that was built on it, around its state. And then uh, Docville said, the old regime, the prefect, uh, hold their hands uh, over the abyss of the revolution. And then the healthcare system works with prefects and people from the old regime that are there to serve health care. And the diagnosis of this kind of system was carried out by Lamnege. And if I can just point it out, he gave a very good definition of the French health care system. He, Lamnege said in the 19th century that the centralization is apoplexy at the center and paralysis at the extremes. Gaspard, you are in charge of a think tank. Do you share that idea? In what you write, you develop the notion that maybe an oxymoron of a Jacobinism, liberal Jacobinism. Can we be Jacobins and liberals at the same time? So the tendency is to say no. Liberalism is decentralized. It's the market, and therefore, by nature, it's an instrument of decentralization. So being a liberal and a Jacobin, is it possible? Well, the think tank is uh, like la payasse of uh, political ideas. It's uh, healthcare is a monster. It's so complicated uh, that we really have to feel our way forward. So I think we have to nuance the position between centralism and liberty, freedom, and individual freedom. Because Durkheim said that in France, liberalism and state uh, approach, uh, they go hand in hand. Then we had the revolution. So the state was built like something that was there to free individuals. Now, Abbé Sies said the law is like uh, something at the center of a huge globe. All citizens are at the same distance. Uh, uh, in relation to the circumference and only occupy equal places. In other words, the state was there. It was not like the British conception with civil liberties. The state was there to cut off all intermediates between it and the individual. And that's why we had the Chapelier who applied this. He was the president for the abolition of privileges. And in in 1991, that's when we had the law. Yes, so, so it was abolished in 89. Now, notably in healthcare, we anticipated the ancestors of uh, uh, additional healthcare insurers. Uh, yes, let me just go back to this. Let me uh, mention an effect of the Chevalier Law on health and medicine. And it was a very highly centralizing law from one point of view. And it was that in 93, uh, Following on from the law, we abolished the requirement for diplomas for exercising medicine So, for in the old regime. So anybody could become a doctor. And this was an, a state action, if you like, against medical corporations. And we're seeing this same logic in Friedman in Capitalism and Liberty. He says the requirement of a diploma for being a doctor uh, is an obstacle to competition and produces uh, damageable effects. Now, a few months after the law came out, there were only negative effects. It's a, it was a rather a trial, uh, an error approach, and there were many tr uh, errors in the system. And as Rospierre uh, disappeared, thankfully, the law was changed. He, yes, he disappeared indeed. So as often in uh, Jacobinism and liberalism, it produced the opposite effect. The state took over in 1994. It founded new health institutes in Paris and Montpellier, and it was the start of a certain uh, nationalization of medicine. And let this expression, uh, liberal Jacobinism, it's Pierre Lombolon who used it it's to reflect the classic history of France that we've forgotten. So I think that having a state that is separate from the nation so 
Jacob liberal Jacobinism is a period of, of history in France. I think it's a concept that applies today to Europe. It separates, it distinguishes between the state and the nation. Having a state that is very high guaranteeing individual uh, freedom and competition seems valid to me today. There's something else, another concept that is very interesting and new in uh, di the dialect between the central state and the rest. That is this, the story of big society in England. This is what Cameron tried to do, and it was conceptualized by the British intellectual about 10 years in the tradition of British radicalism. The state has to be there to accompany initiatives that work, but the initiatives have to come from citizens. This is what they did for the public service. They introduced uh, uh, public service uh, cooperatives. They said to the civil servants, okay, come out of the public service, come out of the public service and organize. If you are in a library, organize a library as a, a form of cooperatives. So the state that was your employer is now your customer. They pushed this logic out towards schools. This set, uh, led to free schools, uh, a report. Uh, was drafted on this and it works well. So private schools, given that the uh, director and parents are autonomous in the way they manage things, and we can apply this to health uh, in the way m programs are managed, they can do absolutely whatever they like. However, with a, a number of uh, broader criteria, it's the state that finances, so it's free. The conditions of access are the same for access to state schools. So if you take healthcare, everybody has universal access to healthcare. The exit conditions are the same because they've got the, they have to have the same diploma. But the way they organize themselves to reach the objectives, it's up to them. So there are very different structures, those that succeed and those that disappear. So it's not a, a centralized organization based on quality and efficiency, but each each uh, organizes them uh, that their own uh, structures. So it's financed by the states, uh, and the state pays the salaries, yes, but you have to recruit according to the national obligation. So, so less autonomy, less financing, that's one of the regulatory uh, paths that we're uh, thinking about in France. And one last thing that I would like to say today, these problems have to uh, be alongside big data and uh, the digital uh, world. So uh, the very open market, a world market, and for healthcare data, uh, this is very important. And now there's recentralization via the gaffers, via Google, because Google is might be a doctor, might be a health insurer, might be a banker, or even uh, deliver your car. So I think that the ownership of data, including healthcare data, the, the big question of centralization today, centralization, the, the centralized is, is the person with the data. So we've got this system, and we've written a lot about this. It's, it, uh, there's the SNRAM, for example, where all of your data, uh, I'm saying this with caution, all of your, you, you, the data that you send to your doctor, all of that data are pooled. You don't have any choice about that. The data is extracted. But the SNIRAM remains closed to a certain number of private actors. It, there are conditions, for example. In England, and it's not surprising, you have uh, opt-out clauses. When you go and see your doctor, you can say, and very few people do this, but there is the possibility, and that's important, I can refuse to put my data to collate my data with that of uh, the collective uh, community. So that's all about uh, privacy. Do, do we own our data, including our healthcare data? Today, that's not the case. And these centralizing forces are using our data, people like Google, companies like Google. And so we could re -de decentralize for innovation and research in healthcare. So as we're in England, so two additional remarks. The English have also decentralized hospitals. We've got the National Trust. They've transformed things and establishments that were considered as ministries or close to ministries. They've also been uh, decentralized with a medical policy. And for the data, they commercialize that data by the GRP to the former GRPD, and it allows anybody to access uh, samples of data according to conditions that we could never possibly imagine today. Now, Nicola, 
big data is it a threat to centralization, decentralization? Big data, does it lead to decentralization? France, is it going to become, are we going to see regionalization of worldwide centralization through big data? This is a possible trend. It's true that the digital economy is an economy of data, so that really poses the problem of the ownership of this data. And we do have a monopoly, a de facto monopoly by Google, which represents the same risks as Standard Oil in 1896. So the first regulation was to dismantle Standard Oil in the United States. So we could actually request the dismantling of Google. But we have other difficulties in France, which are that the SMIRAM is both a mandatory system for citizens and it's closed to researchers and to startups. So this system indeed is completely absurd. For me, it's highly representative. We shouldn't be too uh, schematic. The choice is not between centralization or decentralization. The choice lies between what are the elements where the state must have a presence because the state acts as a guarantor, and what are the areas where we need to let the market, the citizens and society uh, take care of things. And we have a catastrophic situation because the state feels that it must be everywhere, not only in, t in the strategy, but also in the operation. And this has led to four disasters, the disaster in terms of care, because now it's a system where we're rationing. There's a system of uh, situation of care shortages, uh, the problem of innovation. We talked about data, but there are also scientific publications which have decreased by 26% in France in the last decade. The financial problem, because now you know, you saw that Magritte, uh, uh, Magritte's uh, Magritte's painting said, this is not a pipe, and, and now people are telling us this is not a deficit. But there's also this problem of mistrust. It's a terrible situation that in Pasteur's uh, country, with uh, the Institut Pasteur, and in the country, the birthplace of Pasteur, people are today refusing to be vaccinated because they no longer trust the companies. That's the direct consequence of uh, failures of the state. So this is why we're reaching the end of this system and we can come back to the solutions. I think we really need to think about how we reorganize things. No one said we need to go out of this healthcare system, but we should stop trying, the state should stop trying to control it. Let me just give you an idea of where we are. The French uh, medication agency, we agreed that the state should have a presence. So we have a national medication agency managed by Mr. Martin, who, when he sees uh, so many people leaving his agency, he said, we are a technico-regulatory agency. We do not need scientists in our agency. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. That reminds us that uh, 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 we could have uh, medicine without doctors and uh, regulation without scientists. And it cannot work. I think that's the absolute extreme limit of a system where the state claims that it, it's going to replace doctors, scientists, and citizens. Well, let, let me defend our friend, Monsieur Martin. If he said that, I don't think he really believed that. Uh, this, uh, the agency does need scientists, but I won't enter that debate here. But the question is whether we can amend or improve this situation and the system. Philippe Schenk, you're in charge of public affairs at Sanofi. Sanofi, at a given moment in its history, recent history, was perhaps the most committed to uh, contacts with local actors. What was the objective? To have prescription guidelines nationally? What was your laboratory trying to do? And what are you still trying to do uh, through these contacts with the regional health agencies? Well, thank you, Claude, for having given me the floor to this round, at this round table. I'd like to react to a certain number of things that Nicolas and Gaspar said, because I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of elements and issues that we experience every day in our industrial activity in terms of mistrust issues and uh, centralization. Why did Sanofi have this very territorial reflection? Well, because there, trust will exist 
with two prerequisites. You have to be where things are happening. If you ask a guy who's working, for example, in Perpignan to come and see you in Paris, he'll say, it's going to ruin my day. If you have someone in the rhone alpes region who can go down and visit someone who has an idea, it changes everything. So you need this proximity, proximity and uh, uh, sustainability. If you're just coming, passing through, and then nobody else is available uh, to answer questions about these projects, that's a real problem. So you said it was recent, but actually we started these efforts in 2004, these regional efforts. We created a team dedicated to partnerships regional and territorial partnerships. We tried to anticipate what was, with all the difficulties of predicting what will happen with a law such as HPST, we tried to anticipate what we needed to do to be considered by the future a regional agencies as a credible partner. Obviously, we had several years of collaboration behind us with uh, the former uh, hos with hospital hospitals with patients associations so we had already worked on collaborative projects and every year we organized for the past 10 years now and i invite you to this 10th edition of the public health forum in november we invited a region to present its own ideas its projects to share the success stories to share the failures so this meant we were organizing Departitioning the exchanges between all of the actors in public health care at the territorial level. So we used these administrative regions when we heard that there would be a reform in France and a regrouping of regions into new, uh, larger regions. We also modified our organization and focusing on 12 regions because. I apologize, but we did have to attach Corsica to the uh, Provence region. I apologize for that, but uh, it was always a question of proximity. But we're very present because Sanofi has this particular feature of having one quarter of our staff in France. We have 42 sites, 20 through factories, and we're present in 11 out of the 13 new French regions. Let, let, you can guess the second region where we're not present because I already gave you uh, an indication. So proximity, uh, long-term projects, exchanges, and grouping. And the question we can raise now is, should we do top-down or bottom-up? This is what we're discussing every, uh, uh, all four of us here around the table. Well, we do both. Our public health meetings and the public health forum, from the very start, we organized them first in Paris, and then we started organizing them in different regions of France. This year, we decided to start with workshops in the regions that are already underway, and then we will culminate in uh, uh, our meeting in November. And we'll analyze uh, what is the best uh, choice. It's not obvious, but we like to experiment. Now, let me tell you some success stories, and maybe some, and then I can uh, tell you about perhaps the difficulties. Well, we went, as you said, Nicolas, we went to find the innovations where they're located. Uh, there's a small startup, for example, in, uh, I think it's called Occitanie, is the name of the region, in Montpellier in the south of France. And it's a fabulous uh, idea, and it's really in line with Sham. The idea is to, how can we ensure that an employer helps his staff members cover their health care costs? So instead of giving restaurant vouchers or vouchers to purchase books or uh, records or CDs, this startup developed a new concept, which is that the employer gives uh, health care checks to their employees. So the employee will be able to use these health care checks for uh, products that aren't reimbursed, health care products for health care services that aren't reimbursed, such as uh, uh, speech therapists or support uh, with uh, psycho uh, motor specialists. So right now, we've supported them in their incubator, and we've given them a location in Paris because they, from a regional idea, they need to now to move to the national level. They need to, needed to have a location in Paris. So there's also uh, another experiment in in Reims, and uh, it's a fabulous idea too. These are interns who said there are over 1,000 healthcare applications that are arriving from every 
direction. There's big data. Where is it going? Everything that we put in these apps, where does it go? So there is this privacy issue that's very important to examine, but no one gives them a label. No one certifies them. So the uh, French national authority says maybe we could uh, draft a guide for all of these apps, but we won't set up a process and a certification process. I think this would be an impossible task for the national authority, but a framework is necessary. And so what did these people do at Dédé Santé? They, they set up a collaborative method to assess. So it is sort of the trip advisor of healthcare applications. And so you say, well, this one is uh, solid, there's no risk, you can use it, it's uh, reliable, etc. And what are you doing with these startups? Do you don't, uh, you support them or you give them uh, uh, a way to express themselves? What is your role? Well, actually, I'm advertising for them here. They need to be uh, more well-known. They need, uh, well, these these are interns in uh, the Reims Hospital, so they need to make their ideas more well-known. And so they don't always find a relay. Yes, relays are important. Another example, the diabetology uh, ward in, again, in down in Montpellier, uh, actually, no, in Toulouse, they're thinking about how to treat uh, diabetes patients, and they developed a healthcare application called My Gluco Counter, which allows diabetes patients to better organize their uh, nutrition throughout the day, depending on their physical exercise and their activity. And this could have remained something very local and regional in Toulouse, and it actually we're, we're helping them deploy it on the national level. So you see, this can go all the way to m making a local or a regional idea, uh, transforming it into a solution. This is part of your strategy to be present and really help the healthcare sector that goes beyond your activity, just uh, your pharmaceutical activity. Yes, our idea is to propose integrated treatment solutions we're very involved in diabetes, as you know, in diabetes treatment. This can be done with oral root products or injectable products in the future, perhaps with mini sensors and mini pumps. It can be quasi... Uh, I saw a patient at the CISS recently. You, you wouldn't know that she's diabetic, but every now and then you just see her press on a button. She controls her own uh, blood sugar. So there are... A huge, uh, a huge amount of progress that's being made. But yes, we have to address the issue of big data. Where is all the big data going from her connected pump? But it doesn't seem to uh, disturb her because it's completely transformed her life. It's improved her life, her daily life. So in diabetes, perhaps I can add a little more later on, we've worked on top-down solutions, a national solution called Diabeo, and we... Uh, the Canadiens, for the first time, has given us uh, a favorable approval for the reimbursement of this type of integrated treatment solution. And we can go back to that. Now, thank you. Philippe, you were referring to the different territorial bodies. So there's healthcare bodies defined, there are small regions, large regions. Is there any level that you think would be the appropriate level for communication between different regions? Certain countries not France, but certain countries, even the municipal level is important. In Sweden, uh, dependency, for example, is, is uh, the responsibility of the municipality. And in France, we can't say that the municipality has this type of role. Do you have any comments? We talked about grouping together municipalities, uh, eradicating the French department. Uh, uh, what is your take on this? Well, uh, this is actually, I'll have to improvise on that question, but in terms of uh, healthcare, what we're seeing is levels of grouping that are extremely varied depending on the needs and the innovations. Encouraged by digital, you can have groups that are based in a territory or quite local. You have, for example, village uh, groups for uh, dental care, where it's the village that creates its own uh, mutual insurance uh, policy. So that's the very lowest possible level. And then uh, 
at the opposite end, you have crowdfunding for rare diseases that are being developed at the uh, global level. So people who have a very rare disease contribute to funds that are completely planetary to accelerate research and benefit from the research. And so I think this is close to a, a very basic movement that we're seeing, which is that each person wants to define their identity with uh, uh, several layers of networks that will be at very different uh, levels. You can have the global community, and then you saw that there's also the village community. And then between the two, there are all types of different scales that are possible. And that will be the same for a mutualization of insurance. I s I've met a recent startup that's offering insurance for cars, but you could imagine this for healthcare, where they group people together depending on their profile, and then they set up communities with a human size. Even if they have 500,000 insured parties, they'll group them together in groups of 50 or 100 with comparable profiles. And then among them, they will put pressure on each other's. Let's say they share information, and then they'll have a sort of a common uh, kitty, and at the end of the year, if money is left, they redistribute it. And they'll say, ooh, this guy is, is uh, uh, exceeding uh, the speed limit or whatever. And so they put pressure on each other so that they have some money at the end of the year. So, so this means that local actors must be able to choose their level of cooperation, socialization, and then define a regional framework or the French department and the region. That's, that's again, centralism. I think increasingly these structures that people want to belong to are not administrative structures. And the administration is perfectly aware of this. And they're trying to stamp out this type of initiative. Recently, there, there's an amusing story. I'm not sure if we're allowed to talk about this, but because recently there's been an offense of uh, incentive to uh, uh, criticize uh, the French state in health insurance system. So there's actually a local group that worked quite well, which is the uh, cross-border inhabitants with uh, Switzerland. There was a legal loophole that meant they could choose between the French system and the Swiss system. And 80% of them, by comparing the benefits and the cost, they chose the Swiss uh, solution. And then our government closed that possibility. And there were uh, 13,000 people in Mulhouse in the streets who didn't want to be part of the French uh, health insurance system. And that's quite interesting to see. They preferred Switzerland. Well, if you look at the practical aspects, obviously, the centralization and decentralization aspects, I see five main issues that we could discuss. The first is the organization of the supply. So I think it's clear that decentralization will be preferred if you want to do ambulatory care, if you want to do coordinated uh, care networks or a competi competition through quality, this will be from the bottom up. And then there will be a real bonus for decentralization. If you talk about risk management, which is very close to prevention, for me, it's the same thing. We'll never do prevention from the top down. Because today, when you look at things, uh, cyber issues, uh, the state message is always uh, discredited. If you want to do top-down prevention, you're going to reinforce these uh, risky behaviors that you're trying to uh, reduce. This and the economy of these platforms and the culture of risk is a culture of educating people to risk. And this education about risk cannot can no longer be the responsibility of the state. The third thing is innovation. That's clear. But I'm coming back to what was said about the U.S. It's true that in the United States, the federal state has a budget of $30 billion to subsidize research in healthcare. So that's quite significant. So the state can inject money, but it must not try to pilot the research. It should have a strategy indeed, yes. Uh, there should be priorities chosen for these funds, but the state should not itself control the research. In terms of financing, things are shared. Uh, you need to have national objectives, yes, but the, it's clear that the French system, which today actually is a system of reestablishing balance through the shortages and the, these medical deserts and these uh, waiting lines, this is a system that is to the detriment of, it's going to deteriorate the quality of health care. So if we want to have a system where we control expenditures thanks to quality and 
competition through quality, this requires information. And we need information that's more transparent by associating citizens to this control of cost. And the last theme is regulation. Obviously, the state has a role to play here in regulation. You can think about what we were saying early, earlier about drugs, but there are two caveats here. First, if they want to be a strategist, they have to stop being an operator. And then there's another word, which is the word Europe that we haven't mentioned. Obviously, we're in a large European market. Instead of doing what we're doing today, which is accumulating European rules plus national rules, preferably that are antinomic, it's true that the state could improve the system by having both a system that's much more stable and much more visible in terms of the rules and their sustainability over time, and also avoid combining these European measures with national measures. So we're clearly talking about the decentralization of public actors. We're not talking about privatization. The it's the idea that the organizations like public hospitals be could become more autonomous but still stay public. That would be another debate to say, should we privatize? It's not, it's not the regionalization that we're seeing in Germany or privatization. In the few minutes that we have left, perhaps we could talk about solutions. Could we imagine a state that decentralizes itself so it gives up certain responsibilities? The paradox of our story is that we have to ask the state to stop being the state in a certain manner, unless we imagine a movement of, of common towards common goods, which has a sad history in France. So is there a type of contradiction that exists to want to ask the state to stop doing what it considers to be the, an essential part of its role, to guarantee uh, liberty and freedoms, and or quality and security, safety or, and efficacy. We don't really believe that, but they're convinced that they play that role. So how do we do this? What is the modus operandi of this intelligent decentralization towards uh, independent public actors with responsibilities? I think bringing up interest rates is already going to do that. Why? Because the state is going to be in a going to have to restructure its debt, but it won't find the resources at the local level to c offset that, because the local authorities are also quite uh, indebted. Well, the territories already participated in the budget. Well, that will be up to Emmanuel Macron to see if the. Re the state can reform itself. In many countries, uh, the state had to reform after fiscal or social shock, and I think a fiscal shock is more desirable than a social shock. We're, we're all hoping that there'll be reform. When we look at France today, we, it's the last of the big developed countries that has not reformed itself. The state has not reformed, and if we look at health and other policies, it's, a, it's actually a huge political problem in our country. The state was traditionally the vector for reform, and now the state is really the problem. And the state cannot seem to reform itself to go quickly. And today, France is 1% of the world population, 3% of the uh, uh, generating revenue, and 50% of transfers, and that's not uh, sustainable. If we come back to health, and the health industries. Jean-Pierre Raffarin set up some measures, and I'm sorry to go into politics, but he did this in 2004. The Strategic Council for the Health Industry at a time when things were going well. It was not during a crisis. It was because there was a perception that the state and international companies could work together and that they were obliged to uh, dialogue. This was something new and it was just not meeting up one time. It was setting up a real body for dialogue and then during the crisis they, they doubled the process with uh, one group focused on the uh, tech development of technology in the health industry. So there's a certain amount of will that says we need to encourage regional experimentation this was done through the law with Article 36, but in the PLFSS of this year, the, the, uh, they say we're going from the nine regions to 
12 regions because they also included Corsica with the Côte d'Azur, but it has to be more structured than it was in the past. So we're open on one side we and we close on the other. Yes, there are these bodies that are want to decentralize, but the economic uh, uh, management is fully centralized. So the state plays a double role, has a, has a double game. They, they say they want to open up to decentralization for a certain things, but as soon as they leave the negotiation table and they go back to the office, they say, no, no, let's in in uh, in the name of symmetry and between private actors we need to maintain control so the contracts in france don't really commit the state to anything will we work more with the dges than uh, the other body on this on april 11 there was a meeting and the will was to measure the organizational impacts of innovation on a regional level, not the national level. So opening the door up to experimentation in the regions and then measuring the positive impact that it can have on the organization of health care. And we talk a lot about the cost of innovation, but a lot of innovations lead to savings in the medium or long term. So there's a will to try to measure all of this, but we're still uh, far away from our goals. So contractualization, experimentation, evaluation, financial tension. What other tools could push the state, could force the state to make changes, to uh, slash away at itself and to no longer be an operator? They would entrust those responsibilities to decentralized actors, be they public or private. I think it wouldn't be a uh, a mutilation of the state. The state is killing itself with its own expansion. It represents 57% uh, of GDP and the 34% of social transfers. Uh, there's no regalian state anymore and justice uh, uh, security in France. The, uh, the welfare state has just destabilized our, our, our government as a whole. And so now it's up to the state to become uh, a guarantor and less a manager, and it would be a way of protecting it from itself. And the other fundamental aspect, since a lot of policies were built within the nation states, the belongings, the citizenship and, and health is rolled out at a local level, regional level, national level, and European level. And so the state has to accept that it is part on, of this. I'd just like to uh, quote Tocqueville. Tocqueville said the following thing, decentralization does not only have an administrative value, it also has, it plays a civic role because it multiplies the occasion for citizens to become involved in political questions and it gets them used to using their freedom and the agglomeration of uh, their local liberties is the most effective weight against the pretensions of central authority. And this is the fundamental problem today in this debate. The idea that health has to be the monopoly of the state is an idea that is dangerous, ineffective, and is leading us to ruin. Health has to be a, the question of citizens and companies again. So the obese states have to uh, slim down to be more flexible, supple, and more responsible for their uh, uh, activities for which they can't be replaced. As Fried Lander was talking about uh, the, uh, this university, liberty makes people uh, uh, worthy of themselves. Well, the private stakeholders, the startups, are starting to replace the state in some sectors. They we're going to shift the state despite their their unwillingness. Is blah blah car a pu can that be considered as a public transport? Is it a private company trying to make profits? It's hard to answer this question now because the public services are insured by citizens themselves. We could talk about Tocqueville and Adam Smith. 
it's sometimes when we look for private interests that we can uh, reach uh, our joint collective interests and goals. Thank you for participating at this roundtable, and we finished exactly on time. Guy will be very happy.